And Lynn Jeffries is an independent harm reduction consultant, drug user activist, and currently works with the European network of people who use drugs. Uh, they have over 15 years experience in community activism, harm reduction, and drug user advocacy, both on coast Salish territory, Vancouver, BC, Canada, as well as where they are now based in Dublin, Ireland. They have a special interest in drug checking, labor rights for people who use drugs, the regulated safe supply of drugs, community-led organizing, and connecting street-level activist groups to regional policy-making platforms. They currently hold a postgraduate diploma in substance use from Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, and please, Lynn, the floor is yours now. Thank you so much for making it. And thank you, everyone, that's made it to this call. Thanks, Vera, and uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to Core and, and as well for having me uh, do this workshop. So hello, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction, Vera. And if people feel comfortable um, throwing in the chat where they're from, their names, where they're based, and if they're affiliated with any organizations, it'd be great to know where people are are uh, based and where people are, are coming from. So um, while y'all are doing that, I'm going to share my screen if I have the power. I think, Vera, you have to give me the um, permission. There we go. Got it. OK. Can everybody see that? Great. Um, so while I'm doing this presentation, just so you know, I can't see the chat, but Vera is going to feedback any um, questions or anything from the chat. And um, great. So we'll just get started then. So today I'm going to be talking to you all about um, reframing language and deconstructing stigma around substance use and people who use drugs. Um, so I've already asked about the, uh, the introductions in the chat. And just to start off to uh, wake everybody up, I was wondering if we could do a bit of a Mentimeter. Um, so I will, I think Vera, you have the link there. And what I'm gonna do is, sorry. So words about substance use. If you go to menti.com, you can use this code to, um, join in and I will just throw the link in the chat if I have the power. Oh, Vera, I think you have to throw the, the link in the chat there, if that's okay. Let me check because I don't know if I just clicked and checked that it worked and then I didn't keep it, one second. Okay. I yeah. just put it in the chat there for you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Great. So folks can also just go to menti.com and enter that code. Um, just to start us off, I just wanted to throw some words related to substance use to see what people think. Addiction. So there's a big one. Yeah. Drug. Great. Perfect. Feel free to answer more than once. I mean, these are pretty um, definitely very common terms. Alcoholism. Interesting one. Yeah, for sure. Great. Poverty. Yeah, for sure. And I'm going to be going over that as well in terms of the intersections between poverty and uh, substance use. Harm, for sure. Harm, harm reduction. Um, judgment, judgment and stigma. Hypocrisy. Great. Choices. Impulsivity. Great. So some interesting themes coming up here, for sure. Double morale, interesting one. Mental health, for sure. The intersections between mental health and substance use, very, um, you know, they inform each other. Uh, it's very important to keep it in our in our minds about how, you know, we all have brains, substances affect our brains, our mental health, those can intersect with each other. So very good. Isolation, for sure. Things like... Um, the stigma around substance use can lead to a lot of isolation, which again, then kind of creates this cycle of, of, uh, of stigma. Great. 
Great. So some great themes coming up around there. Thank you very much for that. Recreational, overdose, OD, exploring sexuality. Yeah, great. Okay, cool. So that starts us off on a good um, a good place to start or a good to keep those themes in our in our mind as we're going through this presentation. So thanks very much for that. Okay, I'll go back to this. Can everybody see the learning objectives up on the screen there now? Make sure I'm doing this properly. Okay. So I've tried to fit a lot into this workshop and um, it by no means covers everything. And, uh, you know, even going into enough detail about the themes that we're going to touch on, but please do reach out afterwards and check out the recommended uh, references and reading at the end, which I think will be sent around. Um, but I am going to talk about a few main things. So the types of stigma, understanding the types of stigma, this idea of reframing through language, um, decolonizing harm reduction, addressing stigma, and then leaving room for learning. How do we address the stigma, uh, give people space to, um, to have that have that learning piece. Um, okay, so types of stigma. So many anti-stigma campaigns don't call into account the structural oppressions that keep us as a community in a stigmatizing cycle. Stigma is very linked to criminalization and that criminalization doesn't go away based on a person's opinion, but uh, you know, through direct action, through activism, through community mobilization, through community care, and through policy change. So the first type of stigma I'd like to address or look at look at is this idea of structural stigma. Structural stigma refers to institutional and societal structures, and there are various ways that this manifests for people who use drugs. So it can look like um, people not being given access to methadone in hospital, um, being forced to choose between getting care or getting sick, going into withdrawal, people experiencing barriers to employment because of the criminalization of drugs and the employment structures or funding structures of an organization. People who are disproportionately targeted by police, uh, not being given access into healthcare in prison, like needle syringe programs or OAT, et cetera. Um, the over policing of people who use drugs can be acutely witnessed um, following the creation of the war on drugs in the 1970s. Um, and this war on drugs is a prime example of structural stigma. So another form of stigma is can be kind of looked at as a trickle down effect of structural stigma. And uh, this is referred to as societal or public stigma. It's presented through the use of stereotypes, prejudices and discrimination. And public stigma is again created and kind of upheld by the structural stigmas that are um, kind of seen as an umbrella overall. So here we have uh, an example of stigma in design of a service. So this is a bathroom with blue light designed to prevent people from injecting in the bathroom. In reality, this blue light does nothing to deter people from using drugs. Uh, it, it also leads to complicated health issues and harms due to missed veins and abscesses. This could actually also be interpreted uh, as a type of literally structural stigma, also known as hostile architecture. I'm not sure if people are aware of this term. Um, I think I knew what it was before I knew the term for it. But just in terms of the design of architecture, uh, there's some other examples here. So, you know, this kind of pebble dash on the back of a toilet to prevent people from doing dr drugs off the back of the toilet. Um, and this one, which you might see in your cities, uh, this idea of kind of creating these cement spiky environments to prevent people from camping under camp, uh, covered space and an urban environment. So this is uh, known as hostile architecture, but I also like to link it to um, structural and, and public stigma as well. So um, over time, people can accept and internalize these ideas of structural and public stigma as kind of the norm and the negative views that they hear so often, again, this kind of trickle down effect can be referred to as self stigma. So this is often the most damaging. It can lead to isolation. It can lead to people is having issues with building uh, trust or relationships. 
And for a lot of us, uh, if you have experience either accessing services or working in frontline services, you know that uh, relationship building and trust is one of the most important aspects of this work. So self-stigma can be very damaging and people who experience self-stigma also have issues with self-worth. Then I'd like to address this idea of, um, or reality of intersectional stigma. So people who experience multiple oppressions uh, can be seen as having an intersectional lens where stigmas overlap, they inform each other in different ways, and this potentially leads to a lot of complex issues that need complex responses. So if we think about day-to-day -day activities that a person would go through, you know, going shopping, uh, going to the doctor, having a job, maintaining a place to live, maybe interactions with the police, support from friends and family, accessing education. These are all kind of um, quality of life indicators. And then if you think about those day-to-day um, -day activities or those quality of life indicators um, and intersections like someone with mental health, someone uh, living in maybe born into generational poverty, if someone is a person of color, an undocumented person or international protection applicant, someone experiencing homelessness, someone who's neurodivergent, uh, if someone is a non-native speaker, and if someone's from the queer community. These are just examples of how maybe that might impact these um, this, these folks' access to those, those basic kind of needs. Um, and then the other intersection is obviously uh, people who use drugs so you know imagine um being uh or the, you know there, there might be a, a safe space created for queer people um but is it inclusive of drug users you might have a place for unhoused people that has translation but doesn't have harm reduction supports um you know you might have mental health but you might not want to discuss it with your gp because you're also using substances and that might affect your care you know, so when we're talking about intersectional stigmas, this is kind of the things that we want to keep in mind. So I want to ask um, now if people feel comfortable in the chat or you can come in um, on the audio. Have you ever had to address stigma or discrimination in the workplace or in the community? Um, did you find it hard to address language, whether with a colleague or with a friend? Um, and also if you're someone who works with people or supports people, did you ever have to address language with a person you're trying to support? And what did you find difficult about that? Just wondering if there's any examples there. I might uh, try to see people more here. I understand that it's early in the workshop, so maybe people don't want to uh, talk yet, but that is totally okay. So we're gonna come back to it later. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, just, just, I thought it was typing, but it is here to speak. Um, something that happened to me recently, I work with professionals, generally carers. I do work with users as well as part of, of my job, but mostly my, my role is uh, my, uh, people who have decision-making uh, abilities over other people. Um, and in one of the situations, I found that um, sometimes in the sessions, the carers or the professionals themselves refer to the users in, in ways that I wouldn't use. So, for example, uh, somebody said a druggie, an alky. And, and I know that we are providing a safe space for everyone to talk and, and give different um, perspectives. But I keep thinking these guys are professionals. These guys have the chance to... Um, I don't know, signpost to another person or to provide or not provide a prescription and then you are already talking about that. Um, and looking at what you said about the stigma, <clears throat> the transactional stigma, I found another person once I was explaining some difference in terms of biological makeup and I said, well, um, if I identify as a, as a green bin, I think kind of mocking people who have different identities and that was really difficult to address for um I had to do it at the end of the day, but it was it was a hard thing because then it's like, do I have to unravel everything that comes behind this? So it, it's quite ingrained in, in the speech. 
For sure. Yeah. And thank you for that example. Um, a really interesting example of, you know, uh, something that comes up in the workplace or, you know, in an instance and it instantly strikes you being like, oh, that's, you know, not the right terms to use or, you know, how do I address this with this person? And sometimes it's about um, picking the right moment. You know, I've had those experiences as well. And sometimes if it's hectic or if you're on shift or, um, you know, there could be multiple things going on, it might not be the right time to address it then and there. But, you know, you can, um, what I used to do, actually, I used to work in a really challenging environment and I would just make notes when things would happen. And then I would kind of review it later and go, okay, this happened, but, you know, was that something that was actually inappropriate or might've affected the person's care or was it just me having a bad day or something, you know? Um, and that really helped to kind of reflect. And I did end up um, writing a, a letter to my, my manager at the time and it got addressed kind of not directly from me, but, you know, in this kind of team training way. So there's multiple different ways to go about it, but that's a really good example just in terms of, of language and, um, and identity as well. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, great. So anybody else want to come in there? If not, it's okay. We're going to have to do some scenarios at the end. So, oh, maybe Hello. Luca, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, so uh, I'm generally more active in the field of harm, harm reduction and the drug policy, but even in the academia, the faculty members are mm. not really aware of the proper terminology. And even my thesis supervisor, uh, when I explained to him why what I want to research, he asked me, okay, but why those groups, like what connection do you have to them? Almost in the spirit of like, why why do I care? And frankly, um, I believe in, well, the support not punish principle that is mutual to both the sex workers and the people who, you, who use drugs. And um, uh, well, even what I plan to get from this session today is to learn how to use the correct language myself in my future papers so that I can well act in the cooperation with the communities better. Thank you. That's great, Luca. Thank you for coming in. Yeah. Um, and actually, I'm going to go over shortly in terms of places where language is used um, and research in academia is one of them and sex work and uh, people who use drugs is one of the intersections as well. So really great that you're here. Um, OK, great. Thanks, everybody. I will get back to the presentation now. Move everything around here. Okay, so I'm still sh sharing my screen. Yeah, you can, everyone can still see that. Great. Um, okay, so reframing our minds through language. Um, when I was asked to do this workshop, I have done language and stigma workshops before, both in person and online, and I've also attended them and, you know, read different different resources. And what I found is that Sometimes the resources kind of just give you a word for another word. Um, and I think when we're talking about affecting small bits of change, um, one way is to do this is to change the way we speak about certain contexts of certain people. Um, and and this isn't, so it's, it's more than thinking about replacing a word for the other, but to try to understand why we're replacing that word. You know, why are we going to the lengths to, to, um, make these resources and have these conversations. So uh, um, Luca, it was really great that you brought up the research and the academic. I think if you're if you're a service provider, even Mariana, your um, example of the service provision, if you're a service provider, a researcher, anyone working in the drug sector, it's important to keep neutral, best practiced, informed, person first and empowering language at our operational cores. Um, it's important because it's, we kind of lead then lead by example. 
And even if folks who are coming in to our services, or folks that we're supporting um, or that we're or organizing with, even if the, the folks might have language that they use that, you know, isn't great or it's outdated or whatever, we have this kind of operational core of, of language. So I like to think about it as reframing our minds um, rather than replacing our language. So the first term I'd like to think about reframing is this term of diversion. So Garth Mullins from Crackdown a podcast uh, has this to say about diversion. It's a cold word for when we give, trade or sell our prescribed meds to someone else, whispered among doctors and a moral panic hollered by right wing politicians. But really, everyone shared their meds. I've done it, and I bet you have too. As an act of mutual aid, solidarity, or maybe survival. So for folks who don't know, diversion is um, when someone is prescribed medication, and instead of them taking that medication themselves, they are, are either um, giving it to somebody or selling it. So not using their medication for what it was prescribed for. It can happen for many reasons. Um, diversion can happen to help somebody from being sick, to make money to survive. Uh, if people are unsure of the drug supply, um, so recently they did a study on diversion in Vancouver, where I used to live. Um, they're prescribing not only methadone and OAT, but they're also uh, prescribing Dilaudid pills to um, have a prescribed safe supply because of the toxic drug supply on the street right now and the um, the amount of overdoses that are happening. So they did a study on this diversion and the diversion of these pills. And they found that where there was diversion happening, the majority of the participants were mov motivated by a desire to help others um, in terms of overdose prevention or to alleviate withdrawal. So again, being unsure of a drug supply could be the um, the reason for diversion. It can also look like somebody having a bad day and asking for a Xanax, someone having a panic attack and needing something, if someone's on a come down, um, you know, diversion and, and safe supply, these ideas go together. So say, you know, if, if someone's at a conference uh, and they, they're using stimulants, but they forgot their medication, if they ask somebody for an extra dexamphetamine or a Ritalin, you know, the giving that person a five milligram or a 10 milligram tablet is potentially the difference between that person having to leave and go score on the street or not. But if somebody's accused of diverting, they can be kicked off their medication, um, increasing the need for criminalized behavior to stop from being sick. So what I want us to think about is that the higher the stigma, the more serious the diversion is seen. Trading a Valium with your coworker at an office job or trading a few mils of methadone outside your homeless shelter which one holds more stigma and why is this? Potentially the psychoactive effects would be the same. So is it diversion or is it community care? The next one I want us to think about is this idea of cheating the system. So I had someone come up to me once, uh, me and a group of people and they were asking for change uh, and she was saying how she was pregnant and she was just trying to get some money for a hostel, for a shelter. And someone in the crowd leaned over and said, oh, she's been saying she's pregnant for a few years now. And I just thought, you know, so what if she is kind of making up a story in order to to get some change? You know, it's it's my choice. It's my boundary to give her money or not. Really, she can say whatever she wants and it doesn't affect me. So like we have to think about people who are trapped in this cycle of oppression of a system, you know, people learn what to say to navigate those systems as a means of survival. So when we want to navigate this from a strengths based approach, um, how can we use our own boundaries to keep good rapport with people who might be using these survival tactics? So in that case, you know, I was like, I have $10, I can give this person $5, that kind of thing. Um, thinking about it in a more practical way rather than, you know, is this person lying? So rather than a moral uh, a moral um, sense, keep thinking about it in a practical sense. And as, you know, as human beings, as peers, as friends, as frontline workers, 
we all need to have boundaries to protect ourselves uh, and also communicate our needs properly. So is it cheating the system or is it survival skills? Right, so structurally stigmatized language. So uh, Luca, this uh, brings up what you were talking about a research in academia. So there's a few places where structural stigma pervades where the language again, should be best practice at our operational core. I focused on these four areas, um, but there are more important aspects than that. I've just focused on these, these four areas for this workshop. So one area is research. Um, hearing the data that relates to the lives of people who use drugs presented at conferences and parts of evaluation um, and research findings can be an important tool to push forward the advocacy efforts. It can be a crucial tool in our belt as activists and is helpful to combine the skills of researchers who are more academic um, with people more involved in community organizing and vice versa. There's also community-led monitoring, which upskills empowers uh, the community to produce its own research. An unfortunate byproduct of research around substance use is the continued use of archaic terminology that can perpetuate the stigma around drug use. Um, again, as long as criminalization exists, stigma is going to exist, but we can look at the words that we use in research. Um, some words that come up frequently in presentations are words like abuse and disorder. Uh, we know that there are more strengths-based terms, so instead of abuse, you can use use, which doesn't have a good or a bad connotation. It's just facts-based. So abuse kind of, you know, um, denotes this negative thing, whereas use is just using or not using. Similarly, instead of disorder, we can frame someone's issues around drug use in a fact-based way, so we can discuss them having a physical dependence on a substance, um, such as like if they were going to stop, they would experience withdrawal experiences. And if we look at the problems around uh, around dependence on substance use as related to the policies, as well as the substance, we start to be able to reframe our thinking more systematically. So there is a paper, uh, and Luca, you might find this interesting, the Guiding Principles for Breaking Down Drug-Related Stigma in Academic Writing. It was published um, recently, uh, I think earlier this year. And among other things, it outlines five simple points. So using person-first language, using empowering and strengths-based language, um, avoiding jargon and slang, being specific, avoiding generalizations, and using inclusive language. Um, the, the main graph on this slide on the left is um, representation of a da data that was presented in 2021 relating to the overdose deaths uh, in Canada, where I'm from. And there was some panel where it was three presenters in a row used the same graph. And the way that they presented the data was so cold and clinical that a few of us actually just had to get up and leave and it was the first time that I had thought about um, the way that language was used in research and how it affected the people that were, you know, experiencing that that research. So uh, I just wanted to include it here. Another place where language is powerful, but also stigmatized would be um, low threshold health services, especially OAT, opiate agonist treatment clinics. Um, so does anybody know, this is a test for you all, does anybody know the medical term for cutting down on a medication? Anyone wanna give it a guess? Okay. So it's taper. Ah, oh, I thought it was withdraw. I don't know. That's it. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, ta so taper means to kind of cut down gradually. Titrate can also mean adjust up or down. So when you're on an IV medication at the hospital, you might be getting titrated up or down. Taper is used for a detox. If people are in detox, they might taper down mills. Um, 
anyone want to give a go at the the street name or the common name for intranasal administration of drugs intranasal now that would be a uh, sniffing if i'm not mistaken it's... Yep. yeah good one yeah snorting or sniffing so snorting drugs sniffing drugs and the common name for rectal administration so in your bum anybody know i suppose there's probably different words different places want to give it a guess so rectal administration can be referred to as booty bumping or boofing and uh, this term might vary depending on where you are in the world but those are the terms that i know it as so so there's terms that we use, as you can see, like on the street or in our communities that are different that we would use in an institutional setting. But having access to both terms can improve a person's care plan. It can also improve how we work with folks. Uh, you know, if I use subcutaneous in a sentence, uh, that's going to impress a different idea of me to you than if I was to use the term slamming. So... In reverse, knowing the street names can help us support people because it's an ind indicator that we understand the difference, say, between if someone's on 30 mils of methadone and 100 mils of methadone and they have to taper down, you know, it, it shows the folks that we understand what that might mean for somebody. Um, it can also help us support people with different routes of administration transitions, like switching from smoking instead of ejecting, inhalation, intravenous, et cetera. So it's important not only for people who support folks uh, to have the right language, but also for folks who are asking for that support to be able to advocate for themselves and empower their own control um, in their care plan and the support that they receive. So stigma and disempowerment can lead to a lot of hopelessness for people. People go to the GP or their GP for care, uh, only to be told that they can't see their GP today or there's someone else uh, instead of their GP who will see them, but they might not have a relationship with that person. Again, going back to that relationship building piece and breaking down the stigma, it's really important. So this can all lead to a lack of meaningful engagement. This graph here is from a report that was done by Surya, which is the Service Users' Rights in Action, a report called Our Life, Our Voice, Our Say. And it's a piece of peer-led research that shows there's only a small percentage of people accessing opiate agonist treatment in Ireland had a meaningful relationship with their GP. So knowing the language, having the terms can be really important. Say if you only see your GP an hour a month, you're going to want to go in there and know what you want, know how to say it. Um, so this can be really important as well. So again, in healthcare settings, language helps us navigate our care plan. If we have access to the right terminology, we have the power to input into that care plan. The quality of opiate agonist treatment services varies across Europe. And because of the stigma around OAT, the design of services is sometimes impacted. So this is an example of Euro Input, uh, who I work with. We have an OAT literacy and rights project, and that involves drug user organizations uh, across Europe working with OAT programmers and policymakers in their own uh, countries to lobby for access to the range of different OAT medications and also to go through, um, we have this guide that goes through, you know, uh, what the available doses are, what the effects look like, if you can use on top, um, what stopping feels like, what form it comes in. So this idea of kind of uh, spreading awareness of medication for people who use drugs in their in their treatment plan. Any questions so far? You should feel free to come in or say in the chat there. Okay. So another area that we see structural stigma is the legal system. And firstly, to point out that I didn't call this the criminal justice system, I instead used the term criminal legal system or simply legal system, because I think it's important to highlight the oxymoron of the idea, idea of justice in a system that is inherently racist and classist. So instead of using criminal justice, we can say criminal legal system. 
Um, in an article uh, from 2018 called Words Matter, they talked about the terms that discri uh, discriminate or reinforce a criminal self-image, such as offender, criminal, felon, prisoner, convict, <clears throat> as, as words to be avoided. Also, inmate should be used, uh, should not be used as it's ambiguous and refers to people living in any institution, including psychiatric hospitals. So important that we think about the language we use to conceptualize and talk about incarcerated people and their characteristics ref reflects our personal views and understanding. Um, and too often it also reflects our biases and lack of understanding. So it can shape attitudes about people involved in the criminal justice system uh, and the way we grant or limit their access to services. So defining people by the crime which they were convicted, uh, for example, calling someone a drug dealer, their legal status, so illegal immigrant, or using moralistic language um, regarding drug uh, substance use, so drug abuser, is not helpful in supporting respectful interaction. So this table here, uh, I think it offers some good person first alternatives in relation to legal system and incarceration. Um, so person who is incarcerated, person who has experienced incarceration as opposed to prisoner or felon. But I would like to highlight in terms of substance use, it still does say to use uh, these terms of substance use disorder, which um, we would say is being outdated now. And you would actually use a uh, person with drug dependence instead of substance use disorder. So on to work and employment and how structural stigmas interact in that area. I'd like to highlight two areas where this stigma is actively broken down by the fact that it exists. Um, and this is sex work and employing people who use drugs. Because these populations face criminalization and stigma, the work that they do is often undervalued, under supported, and people doing the work might face workers' rights infringements, low pay, unsafe work environments, and other inequities that other places of employment might not be exposed to. It's important to say, that other places of employment might also be exposed to these things, which is why the deconstruction of uh, stigmatization is also rooted in class struggle. So when choosing language to, um, sorry, this is from Language Matters, talking about sex work produced by Shea Stella in Montreal. It's this um, uh, pink document up here in the middle. So it says that when choosing language to talk about sex work, we try to balance self-identification our desire to represent our diversity and the importance of breaking through stereotypes and binary categories. When our choice of words differs from the beliefs and stereotypes that people have about us, people are quick to discredit us. So how and when we use language depends on who we are talking to. So within the sex working communities, we honor the language each of us uses to self-identify. We may, however, publicly reject or strategically choose other language to describe ourselves because language can also divide and support public misconceptions of sex workers. Uh, from another uh, resource here, sex work and harm reduction discourse, they say that using the word harm in discussions around sex work may suggest that sex work itself is harmful. As a result, people who seek to eradicate sex work and sex workers may try to co-opt the language of harm reduction. Also, these days, public conversations around criminalized activity, such as drug use or sex work, often suggest that these policy options are limited to either prohibition or harm reduction. So oversimplif oversimplifying responses to sex work in this way excludes other frameworks like labor rights and other human rights from policy discussions. At the same time, harm reduction has been a rallying point across many criminalized communities Particularly, particularly around responses to the overdose crisis. And it's important to use harm reduction language in the context of sex work in a way that is nuanced, clear, and remains in solidarity with broader communities of people who use drugs. And in terms of employment for people who use drugs, um, so people who use drugs are viewed as experts 
in areas related to drugs like peer support work, harm reduction frontline work, overdose response, policy design and implementation. Um, but sometimes the standards for employment of people who use drugs is not regulated, and this can lead to tokenism and exploitation. So we need to recognize the benefit and push for the implementation of low barrier employment for people who use drugs who have been historically prevented uh, due to stigma and inflexibility of employment protocols. Access to employment to non-criminalized environments where people can um, seek out a livelihood has been proven to improve outcomes across the board for people who use drugs. And in our destigmatization of people who use drugs, we also need to include people who sell drugs in these conversations, as this cohort is often scapegoated and demonized. Um, and often, you know, when people are first to move beyond the idea of the bad addict to the sad addict, uh, often the conversation of harm reduction is, you know, we're talking about supporting the victims. Um, we're not talking about drug dealers who are the real problem. But often these communities intersect and people who use drugs also sell drugs. People who sell drugs also use drugs. So important to kind of keep that holistic picture. So these two best practice standards that I've listed here um, were developed in British Columbia. Oh, they are the um, payment principles. There's payment principles based on best practice that um, was developed from a peer led research called PEEP. And it goes through different points like um, essential that providers understand the complete process and nuances of compensating peers, set up uh, expectations about pay with them, amount, frequency, method, and set this up early on. It also says that it's unreasonable to expect peers to pay for their own expenses and then be reimbursed afterwards. Misunderstandings and lack of expectations can be stigmatizing and develop unbalanced power relationships between peers and providers. Um, best practice in community-based participatory research is compensating peer research assistants for the work that they do rather than expecting them to volunteer their time. So provide an honorarium, um, sorry, contrary to most people who attend meetings, peers are often not paid to attend by their jobs. They still need to look after their needs. Uh, don't assume that they don't need an honorarium or that they would just spend it on drugs. Um, this is kind of a moralistic, outdated view. Uh, pay people in cash. Don't pay people in vouchers. And um, yeah, so those two uh, standards there, basically, they're from, I think, 2018, 2017. So they're due to be updated soon, but they kind of give a really good breakdown of everything to do with peer engagement and um, best practice. So I highly recommend those documents and I reference them all the time in my work. Okay, just a couple more things before we go into some scenarios. Um, so the other thing I want to think about is decolonizing harm reduction and decolonizing language. So to go back to that uh, last slide around legal systems, people with an uh, experience of inca incarceration, um, basically black, brown and indigenous communities face disproportionate levels of incarceration, policing and legal interactions stemming from the prohibition of drugs and prohibitionist drug policies. So in his opening remarks for the Harm Reduction International Conference in 2023, Professor James Ward remarked that Indigenous, Black and Brown people who use drugs are over-policed, have higher rates of arrest, fatal overdoses, prosecution and incarceration for drug use, and at the same time they lay their bodies bare to the triple whammy of discrimination, racism and stigma. This has also resulted in higher HIV and hepatitis rates, Attributable, attributable to drug use among Indigenous peoples, despite the fact that these communities have similar rates of drug use. Also, um, a new report by Harm Reduction International published last week uh, for the first time looked at the availability and accessibility for harm reduction for Indigenous people around the world. Um, and it found that Indigenous people in Australia um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, so-called Canada, and the United States experience greater drug-related harms than non-Indigenous people, 
but they can't access harm reduction services, uh, which aim to minimize those harms. Indigenous communities also face structural racism in, the, in numerous forms when trying to access health and harm reduction services. This includes a, a systematic lack of funding, over-policing and over-prescription of opiates. So um, in a 2022 article uh, titled Decolonizing Harm Reduction by Gideon Lasco, uh, it states that we need to acknowledge that indigenous efforts to resist colonial drug policies are as old as colonialism itself. In Bolivia, for example, the punitive drug regime has long been viewed as a colonial imposition owing uh, in part to prohibitionist policies about the coca leaf that are in stark contrast with people's customs and experiences with the consumption of the coca leaf. And in the Philippines, accounts of drug use before the punitive drug regime have been recovered by historians to interrogate the ways in which um, people who use drugs are stigmatized today. So basically, if they're properly, re properly recognized, these accounts of kind of historical use um, and uh, can strengthen the argument that decolonizing drug policy didn't just come from the West, uh, decenters kind of that it's a Western idea or comes from international organizations. It's actually, you know, rooted in the, the communities that it's it's speaking about. Um, the other things I thought it would was interesting to note is that there's some words that this this idea this Anglo centricity of harm reduction and how everything is quite English speaking based. Um, I was having a conversation with a Spanish colleague who was saying that the word peer doesn't directly translate and sometimes it's hard to find a direct translation for this word. I was wondering if anyone had other other examples of words that might not translate um, in terms of like, yeah, this English language kind of uh, um, dominating the, the sector, I suppose. Um, if anyone has any examples. There's also um, this term narco-feminism that came up recently. Uh, again, it was kind of this term, also these terms global north and global south, I don't really like. And if anyone has any ideas or suggestions on how to say those words differently, um, but basically was having a, a conversation at a conference panel around this term narco-feminism uh, that was, seemingly used in the global north by harm reductionists and there was folks there from latin america from producing countries and transit uh, countries that were saying that like the word narco uh it doesn't it doesn't um mean the same thing you know and it, it elicits kind of a different idea so when we're talking about decolonizing harm reduction in language we have to think about the global conversation of language and not just what works for you know northern and western europeans um, yeah, and then again, translation, like sometimes people are using words and they can be seen as problematic, but maybe um, there's no translation for that in their language. So maybe it's not problematic at all. So all these things to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about um, decolonization. There's also um, a report about cultural safety um, that was put out by folks in... Um, Kawa Wakaruha, um, developed by a Maori nursing philosopher um, in terms of cultural safety and strengths-based approaches for Maori nurses. And then in so-called Canada, um, a 2023 paper on Indigenous cultural safety trainings. So there's two references there for that. And in terms of decolonization, they talk about deconstruction being a part of this decolonization. So taking apart the story, revealing underlying texts and giving voices to things that are often known intuitively by indigenous people might not help to improve the current conditions. Um, and that there needs to be more done rather than just, you know, providing a word for a different word. Uh, so it's linked in, in more um, intrinsic struggle there. Okay. And the last one that I did want to mention as well is an organization called the Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction, based in Ticoronto, Ontario, on the traditional territory, uh, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabek, Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee. 
um, and the Wendat peoples. So Toronto and Ontario and Canada are facing this kind of um, regression of harm reduction services lately. Uh, so I just want to highlight what's happening there in terms of their services. Toronto and Indigenous harm reduction uh, is a response to the epidemic of ongoing colonization and lack of services for in, in urban Indigenous population. They aim to reduce harm uh, around stigmatized experiences such as substance use, displacement and other survival strategies resulting from racism and colonization. They're um, a grassroots initiative that endeavors to reduce the harm and burdens that uh, society places on Indigenous people with stigmatized experiences. Um, they provide access to ceremony, traditional food and medicine, essential survival items, transportation, communication networks, and access to healthcare. So in summary, decolonizing harm reduction and the language we use around harm reduction is not just about knowing what words to say or doing land acknowledgements, but it requires a deeper deconstruction and understanding of the harms, historic and ongoing, perpetuated by colonization and colonialism, and how these harms are intrinsically linked to the drug war and uh, harmful policy. Okay, so I think I'm doing okay for time. Vera, am I okay for time, yeah? Yeah. So right before we're, one yeah. hour, okay. yeah, we're doing really well, not even four minutes to one hour. Fantastic. Great. Cool. I promise I'm going to stop talking at you in a second and we will do some scenarios. But um, first, I wanted to talk about strengths based approaches and strengths based reviews. If um people haven't heard of them or experienced them before. So I first um, heard about strengths based reviews when I worked for a sort of an assertive community treatment team in Vancouver. And we had a caseload of around 40 people for about eight staff. So all these folks were um, had mental health issues and had been given a diagnosis of a concurrent disorder, which basically meant that they were experiencing mental health and also frequently using substances. Um, everyone had a, a variety of different needs. Some people were experiencing houselessness. Um, people needed uh, help with healthcare appointments or welfare, that kind of thing. But while we also did regular kind of case management review, uh, once or twice a year, everybody also got a strengths-based review. So everyone had a primary and a secondary worker. So it was their primary worker that would take this on. And then it was presented at the team meeting and it was also shared with the person that it was written about. Um, it was a way to reflect not only on the work the person had done with the team, but also for themselves. It helped maintain positive relationships with the idea of the ACT team, because a lot of the time the relationship was around, you know, the mental health act and the systemic stigmas of the healthcare system. So we wanted it to be uh, kept as a positive relationship. Um, so I usually, when I'm doing this training, I, when I've done this training before, I do it with a team from an organization and I have them think about someone that they work with who, where it's been challenging or they have complex needs um, or the service is finding it hard to engage and have them do a strengths-based review of this person. But um, yeah, it's not necessarily to answer all of these questions, but just to think about uh, a different way of doing a case management plan with somebody, looking at their strengths rather than uh, their problems. And the last thing before scenarios is this idea of leaving room for learning. So language doesn't always stand still. Uh, like we were saying before with uh, Mariana's example, um, giving people space to make mistakes, you know, do I need to say this right now? Does it need to be said by me? You know, when is it a good time to address language with our friends or our communities or our colleagues? And um, language is always evolving. Words that people used 100 years ago aren't weren't used 50 years ago. Words 50 years ago aren't used today. So giving people time to make mistakes, calling people in rather than out. Um, it might be. Uh, sorry, calling people in refers to informing someone of their actions or words might be problematic without calling them out publicly or maybe provoking them to get defensive or feel attacked. You can't control somebody's response after you say something to them. And very often people will feel attacked and vulnerable if they're called out on their behavior. So 
it's important to know, you know, the appropriate time to do that. Uh, so for example, it might not be appropriate to correct somebody's language if you're in an outreach setting uh, with someone you're supporting and that person is really escalated and they're, you know, using slurs, it might not be the best time to say, hey, wait a second, you know, there's better language you can use. It might be better to wait until they're in a calm one-to-one -one environment. This kind of also applies to colleagues and coworkers, but depending on the situation, again, it might be helpful to ask for someone from management or a supervisor for assistance, or maybe it's an organizational thing to address. Um, for instance, I was working for an organization that needed a lot of um, like trans inclusivity training, and that wasn't something that I could bring to the team. It was something that I had to bring to management first and ask them to kind of make it an organizational wide thing. Um, that also then takes the emotional labor off of yourself if you have some kind of support from from your team, um, if that's the, the context that you're in. Also, in terms of addressing language and um, with people we work with or people we support, sometimes our colleagues might have a different relationship with the people. So, you know, someone might be giving, saying language to you that you're like, this isn't appropriate. But, you know, I know that Vera has a better relationship with this person. So maybe I'll ask them if they can talk to, to them instead. Um, so there's different um, strategies that we can use to address kind of workplace language and give people a chance to to change and to have those conversations um also important to be constructive so why do you want this person to know why they're uh why do you want this person to know their words were hurtful or not okay um and sometimes it's enough to lead by example so if you're in conversation with someone and they're using outdated or offensive language uh you can continue the conversation with them but use the correct language sometimes this is a bit too subtle but and you'll have to engage further, but sometimes it's enough to um, to let the person know what, what right terms to use. I use this a lot with pronouns. If somebody is mispronouncing someone, I'll um, just respond by using the correct pronouns. So it's one way to do things. Okay. So let's look at some scenarios. So these are all scenarios that I have gone through myself. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer, but um, I just like us to all think about it and maybe strategize in some ways to address them. So you're behind the desk at an intake in a hostel, a shelter, homeless shelter, which is also where the residents come up to get their medication. Because of staff shortages, there have been a lot of short staffed uh, shifts and relief staff and there currently seems to be a mistake with someone's morning medication. So when a resident comes up and asks for their meds, your coworker says, I don't believe you're being truthful with me to the resident. They keep repeatedly asking the resident if they're sure they haven't had their morning meds already. The resident waiting for meds is becoming agitated and starting to escalate. The medication is pregabalin, which you know has some pretty intense withdrawal feelings. Other people in the shelter, in the hostel, are starting to make comments and starting to get involved. So how can you respond to this situation and support everyone involved? Shall we just Again, no. yeah, open our mics and uh, have like a conversation or you want us to use the chat? Either way, whatever people are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Um, you can turn on your videos, turn off, turn on your microphones, put it in the chat. I, I think one of the things when I find a situation where there has been like a mistake or misunderstanding, which is actually most of the conflicts come from misunderstandings, uh, from my view, uh, is I start to summarize slowly the different journeys that the different subjects may have gone through. Uh, so that's in that way, first of all, I slow down the level of the conversation by talking slowly and uh, acknowledging as a valid experience what everyone has gone through. And then we start to see where there is a difference 
in in the story and and then we i always approach that difference in the story normally as a as a misunderstanding or as a different way of experiencing it and this way has been very helpful sometimes for me to to be able to to reach some sort of uh, uh agreement yeah that's a really good point like oftentimes you know in this situation that coworker might have thought that the person was being you know not truthful but it was a misunderstanding and actually um they hadn't had their morning meds and the book was just written down improperly and because there had been so many um relief staff and people not trained there was just a a, a mistake in the the medication book so it was actually neither of their faults but it was again a misunderstanding that because again of stigma i think had escalated you know and then you have other people wanting to come in and support the person because they might know them you know or um you know and, and as a as a person at the place of work it's your coworker, so you're trying to support your coworker, but you're also trying to support the person so it can get really sticky for sure does anyone have any other um thoughts or want to come in about this situation at all i think what you said about you want to support your colleague but also support the person uh, i see this happening a lot in service when it's um there is an escalation because the person started to get withdrawal or in many cases, it could be a lack of reassurance because they are so um, used to hit the wall of an organization with a no. So if you can just, you know, let's let's see how can we work this out. Don't worry about it. I'm going to help you. But then do something about it, even if it's not. But pass it. if it's not you, pass it to someone else who could do something about it. So it's important, I think, to not um, re-traumatize the person again every time they want to go and do something and find a, a hard no. But at the same time, you can also reassure your, your colleagues saying, you know, this this been happening. Let's see what happened here and see what can we sort it out. So I think the word for me here that pops up is reassurance and, and action because reassurance alone doesn't do anything. That's a really good point. Action, you know, um, because, you know, if we just sat by and watched this situation happen, you know, what would happen? It would probably continue to escalate. It, you know, other people might get involved. We don't know what could happen, um, especially with people withholding medication and, you know, people feeling, um, you know, dependence on withdrawal and things like this. Um, you know, things can get uh, escalated. So, yeah, reassurance, this idea of de-escalation and maybe of trying to reassure not only the person waiting for meds and their coworker, but also, you know, the bystanders being like, you know, I'll come talk to you guys in a second. Can you just give us a second and trying to create that space? Sometimes de-escalation is a lot about physically creating space between people because, you know, the energy tends to dispel when you're not face to face with each other. So yeah, but action, I really like that point. Ovir, you're on mute. Sorry, I have a comment on my chat from uh, Michaela uh, that states, uh, are there any cameras to refer to to check if that person went to the desk or not? That's a really um, good point. Depending on the service, you might have cameras behind uh, your desk. I've worked in places where in order to access the camera, people had to... Um, file a police report because it was like a GDPR confidentiality thing. So while, you know, we knew that there was a way to check the cameras, we couldn't really release that information without the proper procedural steps. Um, but yeah, that probably could be a, a, an option in some services, depending on the structure for sure. I think the maybe the questions are going straight to you, Vera, because I can't see them in the chat. But that's okay if you just feed them back. Yes, and also like if people want to share them with everyone, just remember to change the setting in your Zoom chat uh, so that everyone can see them. Cool. 
Okay, great. So the next scenario. Oh, that was just the things to talk about, which we did already. So um, during an onboarding session, <clears throat> a new staff member is being trained and they're shadowing another employee as they do a one-to-one -one session with a participant so that the, the new staff can learn the database, can see how they intake people. So during this session, the new staff member being trained observes their coworker using very closed body language with the participant that they're intaking. Their coworker has their back to the participant. When the participant is explaining why they missed their last appointment, the coworker is scoffing and making side comments under their breath. The, the participant can obviously hear <clears throat> uh, the, the staff, the coworker, and it's getting kind of uncomfortable. How could you address the coworker's behavior and make the participant feel more comfortable without making your coworker feel attacked? Again, just want to hear ideas. There's no right or wrong answer. These are all scenarios that I went through, so I'm just interested to hear what people think. Yeah, well, uh, what I would like to add, like from my experience with similar issues, the first thing would be to provide, uh, how can I say, an open and supportive work environment, no matter if it's an NGO with volunteers or with people that work there on a daily basis, there should be a culture that supports all the feedback given and the issues should be raised democratically. And there should not be, let's say, fear of your supervisor. The supervisor should listen, take notes, walk the talk, and always be be supportive. And then it will be easier to raise such issues um, on, let's say, daily, weekly uh, meetings where they can be discuss discussed and resolved. Because I would say that despite it may appear as malice, I would say that there is po there would be there is possibility that there is something else going on that should that should be addressed before, let's say, we consider someone is acting in bad faith. Thank you. Really good, important point, Luca. Yeah, and um, these reflective questions that I've just put up here actually are from a different training called Toward the Heart, but they kind of design how we think about the issue. And I think what you're talking about, Luca, is the design of the service. So how is the design of the service impacting this situation? You know, that that coworker that is intaking that person, have they had a bad experience with that person before? Do they feel supported in their role? Do they feel like, you know, if they have issues, they can go to their supervisor? That person might feel so under supported in their role that it's now coming out in how they work with people, you know, which we've seen before with burnout and not to say that that's okay, that it excuses that behavior, but it does kind of give a bit of reasoning behind it and it might create a pathway to improve that relationship or that person's working practice if that person gets a bit more support from their um, their supervisors. And I really like what you said there about having to open the, uh, the idea of a de democratic kind of open environment to, to feedback issues. I think that's really important for sure. Anybody else have any um, other comments on this situation? For me, something that um, sounds weird is that they're giving the back to the participant. Um, it's usually, I, I, see, I see a problem there where how things are already configured. Like, are you already, the position, the, the space that you take in a place also says something about you and uh, about where you're standing in terms of the people who are with you. So ideally it should be in sort of like circle or even if it's not allowed because it's a very small place, at least see face to face. So to me, it sounds really strange that one of them is given the back. If you don't, if you're seeing them, you won't be doing all these things because obviously you can see it. So that, that's my point. Yeah, super important point. Our, our physical body language says a lot about how we communicate and build relationships with people. You know, if I was doing this workshop and I was speaking to you like this, it would be a little bit weird, you know, if I wasn't facing the camera. And again, when 
they're doing this one-to-one it's supposed to be that it's supposed to be one-to-one and you know with the person's back uh you know there's this closed language it, it doesn't really make it doesn't really ma- make you want to talk to that person about your care your intimate um intimate things you know which which a one-to-one environment should be should be fostering you know so yeah really uh, important about body language and and how we use not only our language but our physical body language to promote destigmatization and you know and support for people great um yeah and again the the design of the service um you know this was a service where everyone every interaction had to be kind of databased into a computer i've also worked in places where there wasn't a computer and people would come in and you would talk to them face to face they go my name is joe i need a bed you'd be like all right here joe here's a bed you know they'd talk to you they'd ask for food or whatever and you might write down notes about appointments or to pass things on to your colleagues or coworkers. But in terms of this kind of data collection of people, it was less structured in that way. And I think it, it created a more open environment um, for people to, to build relationships rather than to take data, you know? So again, this, the, the, the design of the service, which as frontline workers, we might not have a lot of uh, input into, you know, but important to kind of think about. Okay, so you're in the canteen at the end of the day. Your coworker is recounting their day and how they're exhausted. They're discussing a participant that they were trying to support earlier, but they're fed up because this participant keeps lying about their use and lying that they're not with their partner anymore, who in the past uh, has reported, um, has, has, been, has been abusive, has had abusive behavior. They're making comments like these people and remarking how the participant's never going to change. They're also talking about how they know this person sells their methadone and that they're considering telling their GP about it. So how can we support our colleague while also using strengths-based language in this situation? I suppose, again, it goes back to maybe what Luca was saying around staff support. Like this coworker is obviously super burnt out. They've had a really exhausting day and they are, you know, taking it out on this participant. This goes back to employee support, to staff support. Um, You know, they might just be venting. It's unfortunate that they're maybe doing this in a public kind of canteen with other workers around. It might be hard to know how to support the person in this situation because you're not really going to, you might not want to call them out in front of all the other staff, you know, in terms of, you know, they're saying they're going to tell on this person for selling their methadone. That might mean all sorts of things for this person. Um, But yeah, how to address it with um, strengths-based language, without calling them out, without making them feel attacked. Again, this situation happened to me. I don't think I did say anything. I think I actually just sat there and listened because I didn't know what to do. You know, I I didn't know how to address it without them feeling attacked. They were someone who had worked there for ages. They were super burnt out. It was a really not supportive work environment. Um, so yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. I think. Um, in, in- go ahead. Yeah, I think in this case, I would acknowledge the tiredness of this co-worker and perhaps, you know, ask, you know, few questions for this person to reflect for how many years they've been working there, perhaps, or how many hours in a row, so that slowly, slowly, maybe the person will realize that, you know, they are making all, all these comments because of how tired they are. And um, maybe that will be my approach and 
and maybe later in in a, in a different moment I say do you feel better have you rested so by re by visualizing their tiredness perhaps uh, they can see that you know tiredness sometimes makes us have very little patience uh, to cope with uh, uh, things for sure yeah really important point and sometimes relationship building goes all ways you know if we want to support our colleague and build a relationship with them being supportive and acknowledging that they're exhausted um is a good way to to show them that you know we support them and and then they can talk to us and you know if later down the line they we are trying to maybe change their mind or open them up to new ideas of thinking about people or thinking about how they work with people we're going to be better placed to do that from like a friendly kind of supportive position rather than someone that they feel is always attacking them for inappropriate language, you know? Uh, we have one comment from Mariana Suarez, uh, again addressed to me, and it says, compassion fatigue develops from burnout. 100%, 100%. And, you know, compassion fatigue, burnout, we, you know, depending on where you are, where you work, your organizations, your structures, your communities, might not have um, structures in port to, su to support these things, to prevent burnout, to prevent compassion fatigue. You know, it might be something that um, you have to create yourself. And then it's like the, the labor of having to create something to prevent yourself from burnout, you know. Um, these, these supports should be put in place by anybody uh, working in harm reduction, you know, any, any service provider or organization. Um, I, I always think about when I worked in Vancouver in the downtown east side on the front line and we had a, there was a free boxing gym for frontline workers. So people that were responding to overdoses could go and, you know, physically work out until they were exhausted. And that was a way to like process the vicarious and, you know, very real trauma that people were experiencing. Um, You know, it didn't work for everybody to prevent burnout, but it was something, you know. So yeah, very good point about compassion fatigue and, and burnout. I think it's a really important thing to to remember um, and to remember for ourselves as well as for our coworkers and our communities. Okay, I think I have one more scenario. So you're in the common area of a drop uh, of a drop in. And the participant is talking very loudly about people from the queer community using very offensive language and slurs. The person has also been drinking sherry fortified wine. And you know from past experience that this specific kind of alcohol can lead to the person shouting and escalating really quickly. You're aware a few of the people who use the drop-in um, as well as some of the staff are from also from the queer community, but they might not be out to everybody in the space. How can you address the situation without escalating and also provide support to the residents and your coworkers? Any ideas? Again, this happened to me. I have a comment from Gia Di Bella. Sorry, very bad connection and can't use webcam or it fall off. I think that these workspace scenarios have always this kind of perspective on work conditions first, because really it could be about a very biased person who just work there because needs a paycheck or a highly frustrated coworker who's ranting at the end of the day, which is pretty fair. For sure. Really good comment, Gia. Thank you. And that goes back to workplace conditions, this idea of labor rights and, um, you know, the intersections of when we're talking about harm reduction and supporting people who use drugs. We're, we want to look at it as like a holistic thing, right? We want to support people who use drugs. We also want to support the people that work with the people who use drugs, who might also be drug users themselves, you know? So it's really about kind of a holistic uh, a view of things. And I think often 
that gets forgotten when when people are designing services because they're just thinking about the service or the, the people that are accessing the service not necessarily the the employees and the the training or support that they can offer um yeah for oh okay hand up from anton Uh, well, I don't know if my approach is somehow right, but I had few situations and, and that refers both to the community that uh, use substances in the connection with sex, as well as I work with HIV community. And, well, I tried to quite straightforwardly uh, say that uh, in this place, we, we put our all efforts to create the atmosphere of inclusion and diversity. That's why we do not endorse uh, such attribution to people, regardless of their age, gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases, that worked pretty well. Yeah. That's great, Anton. Thanks. Yeah, um, this situation happened at a, a resource that I worked at um, that was mostly staffed by queer and trans folks. And... <clears throat> We had to have multiple conversations with people um, for various different reasons, a lot of it relating to violence and the residents, the, the, the folks that were staying there were all people who had experienced homelessness. And it was conversations around their idea of violence. So they didn't necessarily see using slurs or being homophobic or being transphobic as violence. So having those conversations with people and maybe for the first time you know, opening up those ideas for folks. So that was one thing. The other thing about this situation is that that specific person would only be escalated when they were drinking that specific alcohol. So we actually worked with their team to support them to switch to like low percentage beer because they drank, they just drank every day. Um, But when they were drinking low percentage beer, they were intoxicated and under the influence but they weren't escalating they weren't being hateful they weren't using these like slurs and stuff they were just kind of intoxicated and fine you know um so that was one tactic where it was like a very practical switch um and also then for this situation kind of checking in with the the staff afterwards and you know making sure that everybody was okay um also explaining with this person who was drinking when they were a bit more de-escalated about, yeah, again, the violence and the, the use of words, um, the the ideas of, of, of violence. We actually, in, in this resource, ended up having a signs on the wall that said, um, these are the house rules, no racism, no violence. Violence includes homophobia, transphobia, and sexism. So again, just reinforced those very specific ideas of, of violence. Um, but yeah, thanks, Anton. Good comment about uh, a tolerance and spaces and creating safe spaces, you know, um, and also bringing people in who might not have the language that queer communities have, you know. But how do we open up the the dialogue so that it's it's bringing those people in rather than making them feel isolated? So yeah, cool. Okay, where are we at? 3.30. So we're kind of coming to the end. I had a couple other resources I just wanted to talk about um, before we end, because I, again, this workshop, like I could have, this could have been eight hours, you know, um, but I really encourage you to look at the, the references and the reading list afterwards. And um, if there's any specific area that you want to know more about, there might be some references there or you can reach out to me as well. And I'm happy to facilitate any kind of more conversation around this. Um, there are some best practices around language that have been developed. So one of them is by the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. It's a language statement and reference guide done in collaboration with the Asian Network of People Who Use Drugs called Words Matter. And in terms of very practical don't say this, say this. It's a really good resource for substance use. Um, it talks about, you know, 
slang not to use, person first language, and then a little bit of an explainer on why. Uh, so very good reference for, you know, if you're doing a piece of research or a presentation or trying to bring a person first language into your place of work. Um, so that is a PDF that's on the internet. The reference is on the link at the end. And then the other one, this was put out in 2020, I believe, might be a, a year off about that, Moving Beyond People First Language. So um, it's by the Scottish Drugs Forum and it gives terms and, and what to use instead, but it also kind of goes into more of that unpacking and deconstructing. Um, and I really like this quote from the CEO who he, he used to be the CEO of, of Scottish Drugs Forum is that we cannot continue to think that people can be included or supported, never mind empowered, by people and services that have adopted languages and notions which reflect and perpetuate societal stigma. Um, so this is a really good uh, glossary and resource to use. It's quite substantial. There's a lot of terms in there. So um, I definitely take a look at that. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for everybody for coming and, um, and participating. I really enjoyed uh, hosting this workshop.